Well, we're very excited about the sermon today. Um, we had a lot of comments about the people enjoying last Sunday's sermon. Um, and as you may remember, and if you haven't heard this, I encourage you to go back because that sermon is a segue into the sermon we're going to do today. And so last week's message was, he put his words in your mouth. That was last week. And so once he puts his words in your mouth, then the next thing you need to know is don't be afraid of their faces. So when he's given you the word to speak to somebody and he has placed it in your heart, he's given his word, he's put his word in your heart, I mean in your mouth and in your heart. He's put his words in your mouth and in your heart. And that's something, if you haven't heard last week's, you need to go back and listen to it because it is a great segue into what we're going to be talking about today. But once you know that he's placed his word in your heart and in your mouth, then you need to um, say, okay, now I'm going to go out and I'm going to speak the word and be that mouthpiece for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to be afraid of their faces. Mm -hmm. So, and all of this comes out of Jeremiah. So we're going to start with our opening verse in Jeremiah. Okay, we want to open with the verse Jeremiah 1.8. Jeremiah 1.8. <clears throat> and this is where we pull the title for, from for today's teaching, Jeremiah 1.8. And as Regina said, the title is, Do Not or Don't Be Afraid of Their Faces. Verse 8, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. Do not be afraid of their faces. Amen. So when, when you, oh, you, you're going to do the next one, but when Good you... Great. You know what, when you realize that he is with you to deliver you and to give you the strength and the ability to speak to people, and you know what, so many times we go about life, just about our own life and our families, and, and we go to work, and we come home, and we eat dinner, and we watch TV, and then we get a shower, and we go to bed, and we get up, and we have breakfast and do the same thing all over again. But if you will get up and say, Lord, you put somebody in my path today that I can use my mouth where you put your words and I will not be afraid of their faces and I will go out and I will minister your gospel because we're all called to what? The ministry of reconciliation. Yes. Reconciling those out there in the world to Jesus. Amen? That's Amen. for everybody. We're to be his mouthpiece. Okay, I'm going to, touch, <clears throat> I'm going to say verse uh, Jeremiah 1.8 again <clears throat> and lead into Jeremiah Chapter 20. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then jumping down to, to uh, uh, chapter 20, verse 8. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted, violence and plunder. Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a Amen. burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. How many of you know the word of God is in your hearts already? It is shut up in your bones already. And if Jeremiah was weary of trying to hold it back and finally just, just submitted, just, just went ahead and, and lit, just said, okay, Lord, do what you want to do. Go ahead because it's the, your fire shut up in my bones and it's just, I can't, I'm about to explode. The fire of God is shut up in your bones. It is in your heart. And we don't, we don't need to try to stop it. Jeremiah tried to stop it because of all the persecution that was coming forth, you know persecutions will come. We know that the word declares that. But God is going to be with us through those Amen. persecutions and he's given us the strength. He's given us a way of escape. He's given us all these things. So allow the fire of God that showed up in your bones to come out just like what Jeremiah did. It's, 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 it's the power of God is what it is. And you allow it to come out. You allow his power, which is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, which lives in you. You just are not trying to put a dam in front of it anymore. You're not trying to hold it back. You're just saying, I'm just letting loose and letting God. Just letting loose and letting his power manifest out of me. You know, when the persecution comes, the people aren't angry with you. They're angry for the word's sake. That's See, right. they, they don't want to hear the word. That's what the issue is. You're just a mouthpiece. 
-hmm. And they're trying to come against, that's what happened. And, and, the, and the Lord forewarned uh, Jeremiah because Jeremiah was a youth. He said, Lord, but I'm but a youth. And he said, don't look at your age. I have called you for such a time as this. I have sent you forth. And so when the persecution began to happen, and he said, well, I'm just going to stop talking about Jesus, the Lord. I'm going to stop talking yeah. about God to everybody. I'm not going to do this anymore. But he couldn't mm -hmm. because it was burning inside of him. Right. And he was right. about to explode with the gospel of the Lord for others. All right, now, you know, as we've been talking throughout the, the year, we've been talking about Daniel's excellent spirit, and all of this goes right along with, with Daniel as well, and we've been talking about how to apply the excellent spirit that Daniel had into our own lives. And Daniel wasn't afraid of their faces either. I mean, you think about when Nebuchadnezzar told, them, told him and all the magicians and soothsayers and, and Chaldeans and all, the, all of those of, of that day, and he said, I want you to... Tell me what my dream was besides just, he said, I'm not going to tell you my dream. I want you to interpret my dream, but before you do, I want you to tell me my dream. Now, y'all have heard this throughout the year. We've been going over that. And he told him, he said, and if you don't, then I will cut you into pieces and I will burn your home into ash heaps. Now, that's enough to be afraid of somebody's face. And they stand before you, and he said, this is the way it's going to be. And I guarantee you, his face wasn't too pretty when he was telling them this. You know, he had this forceful, this is what's going to happen. And if you don't do it, then this is what's going to happen to you. And, you know, but Daniel wasn't afraid of his face. And Daniel, in, in Daniel 2, 27, it says, Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and he said, the secret which the king has demanded... The wise men, the astrologers, the, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare it to the king. He wasn't afraid of all of those people either. He made a, a proclamation. He said, they can't do this. He wasn't concerned about what they were going to say to him for the accusations that he made towards them. He wasn't afraid of their faces. He said, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be the latter days, your dreams and the visions up, uh, on your head, up on your bed, were these. And as for you, O king, thoughts come to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this, and he who revealed secrets has made it known to you. See, this is, he let it be known. Man, I don't, I'm not worried about your face. I'm not worried about their faces. I don't even care because, you know what? I'm not the one who's going to interpret this dream anyway. It's God. God is going to interpret this dream, and that brings out the next point that we're going to be teaching on the next time, and that's humility. Yes. Daniel, to have an excellent spirit, he recognized his position, and he never took credit for the fact that he was able to come up with the dream and the interpretation. He never took the credit. He said, it all belongs to God. God did this for you. I'm just the messenger. And that's what we have to recognize. Each one of us are just messengers. God will show you. He places his word in your mouth. And remember, when we talked about the gifts of the Spirit last week, and we said it's not only the word of God that he places in your heart and in your mouth. It's not just the word. And yes, that is very important. It's the most important book you will ever read, and you need to be reading it every day. And you need to believe God that he will give you the understanding of those scriptures. And you can pray that scripture in Luke uh, 24 every day. That he will give you the understanding and, give, and help you comprehend the scriptures. That he will make, your, make it simple to you. He makes his word simple to you and to those who are simple. He gives you an understanding. It says that in Psalms. Psalms 119. These are the things you have to know. Lord, I know you give me your word, but not only does he give you his scriptures, but he gives you what to say when you stand before somebody and the Holy Spirit comes over you and all of a sudden you get a word of knowledge. Remember, a word of knowledge for someone is you tell them facts about themselves that nobody else would have, has told you and there's no way you would have known it. But by the Holy Spirit... And I'm going to tell you what, and, and get this, y'all, the signs, I mean, the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, 
They're for the unbelievers. Because when you stand before somebody that you're trying to witness to, and you come out and you tell them facts about themselves, just like uh, Jesus did with the woman at the well, and she left saying, when he, when he said, you know, go tell this to your husband, and he said, the, the, the man you are with now, the, the one you're with now is not your husband, but you've had five husbands. Well, she said to him, I believe that you must be a prophet. See, so she left there, and what did she say? She went and told everybody, come meet the man that told me everything that I ever did. Did, she, did he do that? That was one of Van's messages. It was so good. Yeah, but people said, these men were saying, you mean everything? Remember, she was the woman at the well. And so she knew a lot of secrets. <laughs> so, but you know what? He didn't. He told her one fact exactly. about herself. That's right. In but her to mind, her, that, in yeah, her mind, that she just, he read her it was mail. like her whole life was yeah. put before him. Exactly. But that's what God does. He will give you words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Words of wisdom are those things that will be happening after that fact, after the, day, the time that you are with them. So words of wisdom, words of knowledge, again, are the facts that you tell somebody about themselves. Yes. You know, just like the woman on the plane said to me, and you have to go back and listen to the message last week, but she came out and she said to me, Regina, I've been sent by the Lord to tell you some things. And she said back, and she named an actual date. And she said on this date... And she named the situation that happened in my life, and this was like three years earlier. And she said, you always wondered why that happened to you. And you asked God, why did, you, why did this happen? And she said, God wants you to know this is the answer of why it happened. And I mean, needless to say, that woman had my attention. Because nobody knew that fact about what happened that day. But God told her. So it wasn't a scripture, but it was a word of knowledge about me. This is what we're trying to teach you. God will show you things, and when you get up each morning, you ought to say, Lord, I thank you for bringing people in my path today that I can witness to, that I can minister to, that you will bring them to me, and I will be able to speak your word that you placed in my mouth and in my heart this day. My sister was telling me a story yesterday. And she said, you know, it was the craziest thing. And, and this was, they were, on a, they were supposed to be going on this flight, and, and somehow they were supposed to have a direct flight from one city to the next, and that flight was canceled. So they had to put them on three different planes in three different cities to get them all the way back to where they were supposed to be. And she said, Lord, I just have to believe that this all happened because there's going to be a divine appointment on this trip on one of these flights. She said, I took the first flight and nothing happened. She said, okay, Lord, I got two more flights. So she went and got on the next flight to go to the next city. And she said, I know there's going to be a divine appointment somewhere because I just believe that, that I wouldn't have to go through all of this if God didn't have some divine connection. So nothing happened on the second flight. So she said, okay, there's one more flight. She got on that plane and sure enough, she sat by somebody that um, she recognized. This person, when Van and I were doing inner city ministry, and they came down to volunteer. This was a girl that came down and volunteered at, at our church. And Tammy said, I recognize you. And she said, yes. She said, and, and, and she said, you went to my sister's church? The girl said, yes, I did. And she started, they started talking. Well, there was a guy that was with her on the plane. And she told Tammy, she said, oh, maybe you can help me minister to him about this thing. He has these questions, and he wasn't a Christian. And, and she said, will you please help me? Because I don't know how to answer these questions. So T Tammy spent the rest of that flight helping that man to understand the gospel. Y'all, this is what I'm talking about. You believe God that when you get up in the morning, that not only has he placed his word in your mouth, but you go with boldness and don't be afraid of anybody's faces. And that your steps are divinely ordered. Amen. Don't ever wake up thinking, well, today's just going to be a ho-hum, blase day. No, call forth a day filled with opportunities to minister the gospel. Amen. To minister to someone directly, to speak the word of God, to, have, to use the gifts of the Spirit. And God will accommodate you. I promise yes, he you, will. he will. He will. He wants, he's looking for those willing to make their lives available to minister to other people. And you don't have to believe that the gifts of the Spirit, which we mentioned them all last week, you can go back and listen to that, but you don't have to believe that the gifts of the Spirit are just for the five-fold ministry. 
are people in full-time ministry. The gifts of the Spirit are for all of us. Yes. Whether you move out in tongues and interpretation or, or, or gifts of healing or gifts of faith or uh, working of miracles. Remember we talked about working of miracles was when Jesus took the uh, five loaves and two fish and he broke them in and fed thousands and the multitudes, 5,000 men plus women and children. That's probably 15 or more thousand people. Out of five loaves and two fish, that's a working of miracle, of miracles. And I, I, was, I told you how when we were downtown and we were serving the people from the streets and we had them come in and we, especially, man, Thanksgiving, we would have a big Thanksgiving feast and candlelight dinner for them and honor them. And, and we were expecting 100 the first year we did this and we had over 500 and God literally multiplied the food. And, and the one example was the mashed potatoes. And the, and the woman that came out, and she, she was our, over our food ministry, and she said, okay, why have you not been serving these mashed potatoes? We said, we have been serving the mashed potatoes. Look at all these plates. And, and it had not gone down. It wouldn't go down. They kept serving, and it kept staying right at the, at the top of the... Y'all, that's a working of miracle. I mean, we had so much food. We had leftovers for all those people. Then we gave all that food to another ministry, and they had food left over, and they gave it to another ministry, which then in turn went and took it to the... I'm telling you, God just kept multiplying that food. It was blessed. That's why, you, you know, you believe God, and you pray for your blessings over your food. God multiplies, and he gives you exceedingly abundantly above what you even ask or think, or more than you would even ask for. And we're watching that. But I'm, I was just, I was dumbfounded, even before... Our, that, that woman came out and, and asked us about the potatoes. I was watching them, and I was telling Van, I said, these mashed potatoes aren't going down. They're not, I mean, look at this. And I mean, it, you know, I mean, I, I was just, wow. It was so exciting. But God, and I, we told the Lord, we said, God, you're going to have to multiply this food because we have enough for 100 people. And we had over 500 that day, and God kept multiplying. The, it was, that was the coolest thing. Man, y'all got to believe for your food to be multiplied. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. <clears throat> be strong and of good courage. I want you to think about that. Be strong. It's like light be. Be strong. God's not, te would never tell you to do anything that you could not do, that you're, he hasn't empowered you to do. He would not be a just God in doing that, telling you to be be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage. He didn't say be strong and be courageous. He said be strong and of good courage. I believe that's courage on steroids, good courage. And it's courage that doesn't have any sorrow with it. It's not courage, yeah. courage, courage that you have to muster up or, or that you have to just do it by the sweat of your brow. It just rises up in you if you allow it to. It will come forth out of, your, out of the depths of your heart. So be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the yeah. land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. That's important. And the Lord, he is the one that goes before you. In every, I mean, you're not just trying to go possess the promised land. He's going before you. This same Amen. father, Jesus, Amen. goes Hallelujah. before you. That's why the, the word says, he is with us always with you. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And I go before you. He goes before you and makes the crooked pathway straight. So he is always working Amen. on our behalf. So in verse eight, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. Do not fear, Amen. nor be dismayed. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about dismayed? It's just like you're just blinking and it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I, I'm, I'm, I'm befuddled. I'm, I'm just like, I'm at a loss. No, don't be that way. Be of good courage and be confident in the God inside of you, in the Lord inside of you. All right, Joshua 1, 3 says, 1, 9. I'm sorry, 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Here we go again. 
Have I not commanded you, the Lord saying, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's in the Old Testament. That applies today as much as anything as Psalms 91, anything else. That is a two-day promise. I'm going to read that one more time. Have I not commanded you, be strong and be of good courage? Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you, where? Wherever you go. Where you go to the restaurant, where you go to a meeting, where you go to the North Pole, whether you go downtown Atlanta, the Lord God remains with you. Everywhere, y'all. Yes. That means everywhere you go, you have an opportunity to minister. Everywhere. Every single place you go, you have an opportunity to minister. You know, and remember, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of what? Of power, power, love, love, and and a sound sound mind. mind. Now, that love, you know, when you you seek God, because he is love, perfect love casts out all fear, right? So when you seek the love of God, then that's going to cast out any fear that you have. So many people are afraid to witness or to minister. You know what? And so many people think, well, if I come to a team and we're all going to go out to the streets and minister, I'm afraid to go. Well, you know what? You should just be ministering every day and everything you do and everywhere you go, you should look for an opportunity. Yes. And when you love the people as he does, then it will just be an automatic thing that comes out of you. You know, this is a strange phenomenon. And I'm just going to share with you something that has happened to me on about four or five occasions. Mm-hmm. And Van knows what I'm going to oh, say. Oh, yeah, I do. But I'd say probably about, uh, maybe this is before Javan got married, so about 12 years ago, I, I, we were in a restaurant, and I'll never forget where I was sitting. And while I was there, now, y'all, this is a phenomenon. Everybody ought to hear this. This is really wild. I mean, I was almost, I almost felt uneasy because everybody in this full restaurant I looked at him, and it is as as if every single person in there was somebody I knew. Nobody was a stranger. She was familiar familiar with everybody. And I I looked at Van, and I said, do we know She said, do you know this person over here? do we know that person over there? Van said, no. I I know things about them over here. Oh, my gosh. I said, honey. And and sure enough, there would be people sitting like at a table catty corner to us, and I would hear the person's voice that was facing the other way, and I could tell you exactly what they looked like. And they turn around, and, I, and it almost freaked me out because they looked exactly like I thought they were going to look. And I'd never seen these people before. I mean, I, as, as far as I knew, I, I asked Van, I said, are you sure we don't know? I said, do we know them over there? Mm-mm. They said, no, I don't think we know them. And I, and I recognized their voices. And, y'all, I almost felt naked. I, I almost felt weird. I'm like, man, I feel like all these people know me. And I know all these people. But I knew I didn't know all these people. But yet that's the way it seemed to me. And I thought, Lord, why is, why is everybody here familiar to me? And then another time it happened, and it happened while I was watching a, a Christian program on TV and the choir members. And I'm looking there and I went, oh my gosh, I know these people. But I didn't know them. But it was like, it was just weird to me because everybody looked familiar. And I'm thinking, okay, where? and I asked the Lord. And I said, God, why is this happening to me? Why is everybody that I'm looking at at a particular moment, and it didn't last forever. I mean, it was just that one day, the first time, it happened all day long everywhere we went. I, mean, I was, everybody looked like somebody I knew. And I said, God, what, what is this? And the Lord said, I gave you this gift for you to understand my love for all people and my compassion. I went, oh, wow. Wow. And I've already decided if that ever happens to me again, I'm going to believe that God's given me some kind of word for whoever I went to talk to. Mm -hmm. Because there was some reason why they were all familiar to me. And I knew their voices. And I knew their faces. Can you imagine? I mean, that is the strangest thing. But but next time, I'm going to go and see what happens when I just walk up to them and just start talking. It's just a matter of, you know, like I said, at that moment, those moments, well, not when I was at home watching the people in the choir. I wasn't uncomfortable then. But when I was at that restaurant and this was happening, I, I was like, and I'm just kind of staring at people and I'm looking around. And I wasn't eating my food because I was just really, 
And, and I told Van, I said, I know these people somehow. I don't know why I know these people. But it was every single person in that restaurant. Now, you know you don't know everybody in a restaurant. But I said, man, this is something that God's doing. So anyway, but it was about showing me his love for his children. And that's what he wants us to see. He wants us to go about our day, not focus on our own life, but how can we reach out and minister love, his love, which then casts out any fear to whoever God puts in your path. You should look for it every day, folks, and not be afraid. Amen? All right, I want to talk, let's go to, you know, we were talking about Daniel. Now we're going to talk about how, remember Daniel took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego alongside him, and he, he was training them up, just like what we're doing. The Bible says to train and equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that y'all will go out and do the things that God's calling you to do. Well, that's what he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they watched him. In fact, they went with him when he went to pray three times a day, and he would open up the windows, and he would let everybody hear him praying to the Lord because he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel of the Lord. And, you know, so I just, this is something we want to help you not be afraid. So he took these people along with him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he taught them how not to fear. They knew what Nebuchadnezzar had said to Daniel. They knew that, that he told them, if you don't do this, I will cut your body into pieces. And they watched what he did, and they followed his actions. Look at, in uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury because what happened was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to his images. He refused because everybody was supposed to bow to his images that he had. And Nebuchadnezzar was furious. And the expression on his face, look at this, changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, Now imagine the look on his face. And he said, don't be afraid of their faces. And it's telling you right here, the expression on his face changed. Can you imagine him looking at them with this fury and anger? How many of you have seen somebody with fury and anger before? Uh, maybe a boss or a school teacher when you were a child and it makes you shake inside? Well, the Lord said, don't be afraid of their faces. So Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were looking at the fury on his face. And he spoke and he commanded that they heat the furnace seven times hotter seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their trousers and their turbans and their other garments and were cast in the midst of the burning furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame and the fire uh, killed the men who were going to put Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there. It killed the ones who were put, that put them in there. Y'all know the story. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the furnace. Now, you know what? Keep in mind, they told them, we will not bow, and we will not burn. Now, I didn't go through reading the whole story because we don't have time. But they told them, they said, we will not bow, and we will not burn. But even if we did, we still will not worship your images. Your, we won't w- worship your gods. We won't worship anybody except our God. And they let him know this. And that's why he had that fury on his face. In verse 24, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste, and he spoke, saying to the counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Then they said to the king, True, O king. And he said, Look! He answered and he said, I see four men, four men, praise God, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Y'all, that is huge. That is huge. Nebuchadnezzar recognized the Son of God. The Son of God who had not even come in the form of man yet. I want you to think about this. But because three young men made a decision for God, I'm not going to be afraid of your face. I don't care what you do. 
We will not burn. We will not bow. No matter what you do, even if we did burn, we're still not going to bow to you because they believed that the Lord would raise them up. Y'all, this is what we have to see. And you know, the day is coming. Actually, the day is here where persecution has hit this world. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But we cannot be afraid of the faces of those who are trying to get us to go against God. We have to make a decision. We will not burn. We will not. No matter if you chopped off our head, no matter if you do anything, we will not serve anybody but our God and the Lord Jesus Christ is whom we will serve. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, Joshua 2, verse 8. Joshua 2, verse 8. Now, before they lay down, she... Rahab the harlot is who we're talking about. And we're talking about the spies and the two spies and Rahab the harlot. And before they lay down, she was hiding them. She, Rahab the harlot, came up to them, the two spies on the roof, and said to the men, I know, now think about this, this is Rahab the harlot. And she's telling these men of God, she said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, and when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. As soon as we heard these things about you, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Amen. Now, is that really powerful what came out of Rahab the harlot's mouth? It's, it's just amazing. She was she's just an amazing woman of God. And what she's saying is, even though you might have been thinking differently, you might have seen things differently, and everybody, all, all the Israelites might have seen, and the army might have seen thinking, oh, well, these people are thinking one way, but what she's saying is all the enemy was quaking in their boots. They'd seen what had been done, seen and knew that the, the God of, the, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was absolutely with them, and that they have already, see them that first part, where it said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. They already see, and they're telling the two spies that God has already, Rahab's telling them, we know God's already given you the land. So, you know, this is a woman that's telling this to two seasoned spies, soldiers, whatever. We've got to know in our hearts that the Lord has already given us the land. Too many times we're trying to possess land or possess the land and we're trying to possess things in life that already belong to us. Amen. That's right. Amen. They're ours. That's right. And we're trying to, oh, well, we're fighting the good fight of faith. Well, some of the good fight of faith is not necessary. It's just maintaining or holding on to what already belongs to Ooh, us. That's good. That God has Amen. already gone before us and yes. possessed these things. And those things which Jesus has possessed, they belong to us already. That's right. That have already been paid for through the finished work of the cross. Amen. That's good. So, my goodness. So, when these little, little, uh, peep squeaks or demons or uh, <laughs> devils or whatever trying to, you know, accuse her of the brethren and try to raise up and say, you don't have it. You, this doesn't belong to you. That's what you think. You're misguided. You're, you're not get, seeing the big picture. You say, get. You say, no, no, ma'am, no, sir. This, these things are precious promises of God. This is how he treats his children. This is what my possession is, and you're not going to talk me out of it. And I'm not, I'm not just like she was talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not going to bow, and we're not going to burn. You know, and speaking of that, I didn't even mention the fact that when they came out of that, didn't even smell like smoke. They didn't even smell like That's smoke. Right. When they took them out... Then Nebuchadnezzar said, we're all going to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, mm -hmm. and Abednego. That's right. 
And then they promoted them. Yeah, it makes believers out of folks. I'm telling you that yeah, good stuff. That's it, exactly. Now look at Numbers 13. And we got some more of this going on here. I love this kind of stuff. It's like it's like a gunslinger coming into town and you know, with a you sheriff and, 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 the, and the sheriff is there and says <laughs> And the person said, this town's not big enough for me and you. You know, it's just kind of like gunfight at the OK Corral. It's, Jesus wins every time. The Lord always wins. Numbers 13.30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, then they start saying what they have seen. They start uh, saying the facts instead of the truth. How many of you know there's a difference between facts and truth? Facts are facts, and they don't necessarily mean it's the truth, but it's what either science has said or somebody else has said, or, it's, or this seems to be a fact, but it's not it's the, tr the truth because Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. So if it doesn't line up with Jesus, it's not the truth, no matter what it's a fact. It might be a fact that you have a report that you have cancer in your body, but that's not the truth. That's right. It's that's just right. a scientific fact. But the truth is, by his stripes, you Amen. were healed 2,000 years ago. Lord it already God, belongs yes. to you. So that's always that's right. let truth Amen. trump the facts that you're presented in that's your life. That's good. Only, and it's not a truth, it is the truth. So he says, we are not able, in verse, that same verse, we're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And how, how you know they're stronger than you? Because that's what we observed. I mean, these are some big rascals. They're stronger. <laughs> we, this is what I've seen with my, and, and taken in with my senses. <laughs> and it said, and they give, the, it said, stronger than we, verse 32, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. In other words, they're giants kind of men. So, I mean, this thing just keeps getting uglier all the time, according to these spies. And verse 33, there we saw the giants, which were the descendants of Anak, came from the, the, the giants. And here we go. This is, the, this is the, where the meat is right here. And this is where the, oh, there's such a lesson. There's a five-week lesson on this right here. And we were, there's, he's saying it like fa a fact. And we were like grasshoppers in our own oh, sight. God. And so were we in their sight. Now, what's going on here? Because they were so moved by their senses, so they were so, because they were so moved by what they saw, what they felt, what they heard, and they, they developed a perception that was greater than the God that they served. And that perception was propelling them, and they then in their own minds came up with, wow, compared to this, compared to that, compared to these giants, compared to this thing, we are nothing but grasshoppers. So they were grasshoppers in their own sight. And now keep in mind, it's not about these people say, oh, you bunch of grasshoppers, and, and, and <laughs> the, the, the enemy is saying, you're grasshoppers. No, all it took was the, and the devil messing with them and getting them to believe That's that right. you are nothing but grasshoppers by what you see, what you hear, what you think, what you feel. And it says there again, and we were like grasshoppers in That's our right. own sight. And so we were in their sight. So because you internalize that because you believe right. that because it became the gospel to you that you were a grasshopper then you projected that on the enemy you projected well we because of this surely man i mean we look we're grasshoppers in our own sight you know what they must be thinking that look at those little grasshoppers but that's not what they were thinking at all right we just read that earlier it said they were quaking in their boots they were shaking. They were like, they've already taken the land. 
And yet these people had seen themselves. As a man or woman thinks in their hearts, so are they. That's right. And so the next verse ties right in this because it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. And I'm doing this in the King James. It says, for, King James, it says, for we, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal weapons, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, the imaginations of the heart, imaginations of the mind, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have to cast down those imaginations. These were, these were two kind of ma ma imaginations. They were uh, speculative imaginations and they were imaginations of lies. They were speculative. They were speculating. They didn't even realize they were speculating and, and presumptuous imaginations. And because they saw and because they deduced and because they then believed, because they believed what their, five, their senses were telling them, then they were projecting, ready to project that on the enemy. They were all but ready, these, spies, these other spies ready to, we might as well surrender before we go any further. But it was such a lie. It was such, built on lies, and yet, if, let's turn this around, had these spies known their God like they should know him, they would say, this is what my mind is telling me, these are what my senses are telling me, but I'm not going to be moved by my thoughts and my senses. I Amen. know that we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then therefore, go back and report, we are well able to take the land, not we can, oh man, we're just a bunch of grasshoppers. We, we know we're grasshoppers. They we know we're grasshoppers. Everybody knows we're grasshoppers. But nobody thought anybody thinking about Grasshoppers wasn't even part of the equation. Nobody was seeing grasshoppers, especially on the enemy side, until those, these spies started declaring it, and this is what they're seeing, it, and then they projected it on, on the enemy. Now, I want to share a story with you about the praise and worshipers in the heat of the battle. You know the story. So instead of reading it all, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is just let's talk about it. Um, and it's in Second Chronicles 20, so you can write that down, the whole chapter of Second Chronicles 20. The first verse says, As it happened after this, the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others besides them, and the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat, I'm just going to uh, you know, give you a synopsis of it because Jehoshaphat was so afraid because this was a much bigger army than what the number of the people that they had. He was so afraid. But the Bible said that he went and he sought the Lord and he proclaimed a fast among his people. And that's how you, when you are dealing with fear, the very best thing you can do is to go and seek the face of God and go and get before the Lord and let him build up your confident expectation. He said, I've given you an expectation, a, a confident expectation. He has given that to us to give you an expected end. And you believe for the expected end, and he will give you the confidence to believe for it. But you have to seek him. When, you, when fear tries to come on you, and you have to go and get before him and apply his faith that is placed within you. Yes. Amen? Are y'all with me in that? Mm -hmm. So that's what Jehoshaphat did. Um, and then it came, and there was, uh, uh, Jael came, and he prophesied to them about what was going to happen. And he told him, he said, man, the battle is not yours, but it's his. It's not your battle. It's his battle. When you go out to speak to people, it's not your battle. It's all the word of the Lord, and it's things that he already fought for for you by the cross. Amen? So let me go down here, and it says, um, tomorrow, go down, this is verse 16, go down against them. They will surely come up by the... Uh, ascent of this and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel you will not need to fight in this battle 
Position yourselves, stand still, and, this, and see the salvation of the Lord. They had to go and get their faith built up to believe God, to understand that this was not their battle. He had already taken care of this for them. They were going to win this battle because it was already in the Lord's hands. You will not need to fight this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So they rose early in the morning, and they went out to the wilderness, in verse 20 of Tekoa. And they went out, and Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And now see, look at the difference. in Jehoshaphat, before he prayed and fasted, look at him now. He said, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe in his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he had appointed those who should sing praise and worship to the Lord, who should just sing. The Lord wants us to sing. The Lord wants us to worship him. The Lord does not want us to fear. He wants us to worship and to yeah. praise his holy name and let him take care of the battle. Let him take care of the situation. Let him work it out. Amen. So, and when he had consulted the people, and he appointed those that should sing to the Lord and who should praise in the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, they were saying and singing, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now look at verse 22, y'all. This tells it all. Now, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, set his, and to, when they began to pray, sing and praise, um, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who came against Judah, and they were all defeated. You know why? Because they all fought against themselves. The Lord will bring such confusion to the enemy's camp. Are y'all listening? The Lord will, are you hearing what I'm saying? He will bring such confusion. God is not the author of confusion of peace, but of peace. And he will bring peace to you, and he will bring confusion to the enemy. And they will defeat themselves. And all they had to do was to praise God. And they sang praises. Can you imagine? Can't you see Jessica leading us in worship and all of a sudden all the enemies are just defeated? That's the kind of praise and worship team we've got, glory to God. And we will follow them and we can see every, every enemy defeated right before our eyes because we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and you keep your eyes on him just like when Peter was walking on the water. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to do the supernatural and walk on water. Sorry. But the moment he got into fear, the moment he became afraid and he took his eyes off of Jesus, the Bible said he began to sink. And it's like Dan has always said, tell him what you always have said. About beginning to sink? Yes. Well, had Peter, Hallelujah. this is just what I believe, but had Peter, uh, of course, he took his eyes off of Jesus and he put his eyes on the elements, the things going on with the wind and the waves and, and boisterous uh, waves. And the word says he began to sink. Now, I believe as he was beginning to sink, the reason why he didn't go kaplunk <laughs> was this was a supernatural thing anyway, him walking on the water. And he came on, based on what Jesus said, come. That was his permission. That was his, what he was coming on. He was, the word of God said, come. And so, therefore, he was enabled to walk on that water. But when he, when he started doubting and had doubt and unbelief, then he began to sing, sink. But I believe, and, of course, this is not in the word, but I believe in my heart, had he stopped as he was sinking, oh, my God, what am I doing? Not, I was walking on water. And, nope, I believe, I believe, I rebuke that, uh, that uh, doubt and unbelief. I believe, I believe he would have come right back up to the top because he was beginning to sink. Now, of course, he didn't, and he just went down. And then Jesus, you know, grabbed That's you right. by the hand, oh, ye of little faith and all this kind of stuff. But, but it did not have to be that way. No, and I, I believe that, that Peter, had he made it to Jesus and he never let fear creep in, mm -hmm. I believe that he would not have denied him at the cross three times. Yeah. Just think about that. All right, do we have time for this one or should we skip on down to? We had a lot to share with y'all. And we're going to take communion. No, I think this is fine. Okay, go ahead. Acts 18, verse 9. And I want you to, to keep in mind the whole title of this is do not be, don't be afraid of their faces. So many times... 
I mean, you may have been guilty of it, but I can tell you for most of my life growing up, I mean, until I started, you know, really getting into the Word, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years, whatever it was, 30 years ago, and, and knowing that it's not their faces that count. It's what's going on by the Spirit of God, what's, what's happening, the power of God, and what power resides in us. And you would look at people's faces, and I was really pretty good, especially after working at Delta Airlines and working on the ticket counter and working in the gate. Now, when I was downstairs cleaning out airplanes down on the ramp or working, you know, with bags and everything for five years, I, there were no faces really to look at. There were bags to look at and all kind of stuff like that. But when, you got, when I got on the ticket counter and, um, and uh, also the ticket counter and the gates on the busiest, at the busiest airport in the world and the busiest shift in the world, and their faces became very prominent to me because it's like I'm looking to see if this passenger is mad, if he's angry coming up mad already. Or if he's, you know, or is, is he fixable? Is he go, just, you know, irate and, and just, you know, you can't do anything. So the faces, I would judge situations because you're just, you know, the weather would be irregular and people would be mad. You'd have 200 New Yorkers standing in front of you at one time screaming they want to kill you and everything else. And it was just like, you know, it was just part of everyday life because their flight was later, they missed their connections or whatever else. But as I went on later in life and after being a Delta and everything, and then I learned don't look at their face, don't look at people's faces for anything. Don't let internalize what's the look on their face. Their mind might be thinking about something else. Their mind might, they might, but whatever it is, don't take stock in their faces. Only what God tells you. Be moved by the Spirit, be moved by what God says, and don't look at natural things. It's the same thing as looking at, you know, seeing yourself as a grasshopper because you're looking at natural things rather than seeing things by the Lord. So Acts 13, 9 says, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision. Be not afraid, but, I, but speak and hold not your peace. For I am with you, and no man shall set on you to hurt you. For I have much people in this city, and he continued there a, six, there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Continuing on down, 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. Now, notice it doesn't say what we always imply. Perfect love cast out all fear. That's already implied already. It doesn't say the word all there in the New King James, King James, or any version but what it means when it says perfect love cast out fear, that's what God means. It cast out all fear. So it is implied in that. It's, it's, you know it's already part of that. Because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Acts 18 verse 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night. Oh, that's the same. Well, we already did that one a while ago. All right. Look down at... Um, Revelation 13, right? Is that the next mm -hmm. one? Okay, Revelation 13. Go over the Revelations. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a, like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, this is talking about the Antichrist yes. and, and the, the mark of the beast. Y'all, we have to realize there is coming a day. And things that are going on in the world right now is all preparation for the end times. There are things, and it, when it says here, I want you to look at what will happen. And now, this, this beast that will come out and at the end times, he will come out like he's there to serve and be there for everybody and to do good things. But on the other side, he's evil. That's why it says here, he has two horns, one like a lamb, and then he spoke as a dragon. So it, there's two sides of this. And it says in... in, uh, in uh, 16 and 17 of, of Revelation 13. It says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and, and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Now listen to this, y'all, in verse 17. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, which is the number 666. Y'all, you, you've, I know you've heard of this. So the things that are happening in this day, when, when they are wanting to force people to place something in their body, 
And in many states, they're already saying, if you don't have these things in your body, if you don't have this in your body, then you will not be able to buy. You cannot go to a restaurant. You cannot sell. You cannot go to grocery stores and get food. This is the preparation of what's happening in this day. So you know what? We have to make a decision of our heart. We have to stand our ground. I'm not, I am telling you that this is all, there was a day where I thought, I can't even imagine how a mark of the beast could even be, why anybody would even accept it. But the pressures and what's happening right now in the world, y'all know what the things that are going on in the world today. We have to prepare our hearts and to stand firm. Yes. And we have to, we have to seek the Lord and we have to be determined that when the day of persecution comes and they tell you, you will do this, or you cannot buy and sell, or you cannot have a job. You'll have to quit your job if you don't do this. Y'all, you have to get before the Lord, and you have to seek his face, and you cannot be afraid of their faces, and you have to do what the Lord is telling you to do. But the day is coming when there will be a mark of the beast. What are you going to do? We don't know if that's two years from now, 10 or, years from now, or 200. 50, 50, 100, we don't 200 know. years from now. But... The signs of the time. Yeah. He said, you won't know the day or the hour, but you, you will know, know the, the signs season. of the time. You'll know the season. And the season. Yeah. And these are the things that are happening in our world today. Yes. So we have to, we have to, man, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Do not, do not be afraid of the faces of anybody. And never go against the word of God. That's yeah. the best advice that we can give you. You need to be prepared. You need to be, you know, about the ten virgins waiting for the bride. Man, you better be prepared. You know what? We have to be prepared as if he's coming tomorrow. But you know what? We keep occupied. We don't just sit and wait. We continue to stay occupied, but we prepare our hearts to be ready and not be afraid of anybody's face, no matter what they ask you to do. Now, I want to use, we're going to use two last examples, and then we're going to take communion. And I want to talk about Stephen. I wish I could read this whole, there's three chapters here that I wish we could read about Stephen. And we can't, we can't do that. But in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. In Acts chapter 7, verse 54, now you can read... Uh, it's 6, 7, and 8, or 5, 6, and 7. Anyway, it's, five, I, it's all in there. And read it for yourself because it's a great study. But when Stephen, it says Stephen, be, then he was a martyr, as you know. But when, he heard, when they heard these things, he was preaching the gospel, the yes. good news. And he was going back and talking about Moses and what all Moses did to lead the children. He just went through the whole story of the Old Testament. And he was trying to encourage the people to come to know God in their hearts. And Jesus. And, and Jesus. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed him with their teeth. And they were gritting and they were coming after him. And it says, but he, look at this, being full of the Holy Spirit. You know what? If we stay full of the Holy Spirit, fear yeah. will not have any part of us. That's right. And being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see the heavens open as they are literally stoning him. He said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you know if you're being persecuted and for those who were called to be martyrs, the grace of God is with him. I fully believe that the time that Stephen was being stoned, I don't think he felt pain. Because he was seeing the right hand, he was seeing the hand of the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. In verse 59 of chapter 7, it says, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Now look at this, this shows love and perfect love cast out any fear that would have been there. And he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And look what it says. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
The grace of God was there with him. The power of God, his grace was there for him. He did not suffer, y'all. I believe that with every fiber of my being, that the grace of God was there. The moment he was being stoned to death, he was completely saved by God. And he gave up his life. What does that sound like? All right. Jesus. So that leads us to our last part. And you know, the, one of the verses Regina read a while ago where it says, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. We've said that, this in here before. But the Son of Man is seated at the right hand of God. But he was standing for Stephen. Gave him a standing ovation. <laughs> Amen. I want to stand in ovation to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Jesus. Amen. Let's do it. All right. Stephen was a type, of, as we said a while ago, a type of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 40, no, uh, chapter I'm sorry, 27. 27, verse 45. Now from the, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabantadia. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then verse 44 says, in Luke, 20, uh, Luke 23, verse 44 says, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the, well of the, temple, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. You know, and so we're, we're talking about three different versions of this story. And in John chapter 19 and verse 28, we didn't go through what all happened before the crucifixion, but um, or before they were crucifying the Lord, we didn't have time to go into everything. But it says here, after this, Jesus in verse 28, John 19, 28, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, this that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. This was prophesied that this would take place. Now the vessel of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with the sour wine and put it on a hyssop and put it up to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He took care of everything for us. There is nothing that we have to do but just receive his glory and his grace. And he already told the father in the prayer before he went, when he was at Gethsemane, and he said, Lord, the glory, the father, the glory that you've given to me, I give it to them. He has given us his glory. He has given us his faith. He has given us his joy. Everything about him, he has given it to us. His power, his anointing, it all rests within yeah. us because he paid the price. And he sacrificed. He sacrificed. And he, at first he said, you know, when he was praying to the Lord, he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will. At that moment, I think he probably experienced a moment of fleshly fear. But he said, God, not my will, but yours be done. And I'm going to complete the task that was set before me. And so he came and he did that. As they beat him. And he bore stripes for our healing. And they took that ball with that metal ball, or no, iron ball, whatever, and with the, the points and all the stuff that came out of it, and they took it. And he said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, that was the chastisement part was placed upon him by his stripes, we were healed. And they took that thing and they flung it out there and ripped his flesh out of his body. Went down to the bone and ripped his flesh out for our peace. That's what he did for us. That's what he did for you and that's what he did for me. Y'all, I'm going to tell you what. Please know this. You do not suffer. He paid for our suffering. Yes. You do not suffer. He does not put sickness and disease on you to teach you a lesson. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And that's what religious tradition is telling people. That is not true. That is not true. 
He does not do that. That is not the God we serve. Any suffering that you deal with is persecution and there is grace that he's given you to go through those moments. I fully believe that. But when those pains and sorrows and sicknesses and diseases come on your body, that is straight from the pit of hell. God doesn't allow it and he doesn't cause it. And anybody who has ever told you that because you did wrong and he needs to teach you a lesson, that is a bunch of... I won't say what it is. But you know what it is. And I am sick and tired of the traditions of men making the word of God of no effect. He does not do that. That is not the loving God that we serve. That would be as foolish as us taking a child that we want to teach them not to touch a stove and go and put their hands on there and burn them. Say, now I bet you don't ever do that again. Y'all, that is foolishness. But he paid the price so that not one of you would have to suffer. So that not one of you would have to remain sick. When sickness comes on your body, man, rebuke it. Rebuke it. People that have dealt with COVID, people that are still dealing with COVID, I command it to stop in the name of Jesus. Amen. That is an evil man-made disease. It is evil. And it's so demonic. But you know what? We have the power to come against these things. We have the power to come against cancer. We have the power. Like Van said, we are already healed. He already paid the price for cancer. He already paid the price for our sins. He already paid the price for depression. He already paid the price for all of that. He took it to the cross. Now we're going to take communion. How many of you did not receive your communion elements? We have some up here that did not receive their communion elements. Anybody? And some over here. Y'all, I'm telling you what. God loves you so much. Keep your hands raised up, please, if you have God to. loves you so much. Please don't believe the foolishness that religious traditions of men has said to you. He is a loving God. He sent his son to die on the cross for us. To bear everything for us. You know what? We are in this world, but we are not of this world. I don't care how cruel things get out there in the world. We do not have to fall prey to it. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? We do not have to fall prey to this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. Everybody has their elements. Hallelujah. Elements. Thank okay. you, Jesus. I'm going to be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to start you, in uh, verse uh, 23. Hallelujah. Thank For you, Jesus. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver it unto you. Thank you, Jesus. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Hallelujah. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus. This do what in remembrance of what? Of your sins? Of your transgressions? Of your failure to do something? Or your something you should have done and something you, you hadn't done? Your sin of omission or your sin of commission? Either one, whether you've committed or omitted? No. He said, this do in remembrance of me of Jesus, doing it in remembrance of him and everything that his finished work of the cross entails. Everything. That's what he wants us to focus on is himself, Jesus, and what all he's accomplished and done for us that he will never have to do again Thank because it was once and for all forever. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to take the, bro the, the broken body of Jesus. Before we do this, those of you that are watching online, Go get something. If you don't have grape juice, I don't care what you have. Yeah. If it's milk or Kool-Aid, I don't really care what you have. Just get something and some kind of and cracker. some kind of juice, whether it's grape juice, like she said, or orange juice. Or anything. Water, it doesn't anything. matter. We believe it's blessed. Yes, it is blessed. So just get something and take communion with us That's as right. we do this here in That's the sanctuary, right. okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to pray. Or I'm going to speak first about this, about the broken body, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to partake of the broken Thank body. You, Jesus. This, his body Thank you, Jesus. Thank was Jesus. broken 
for us, for everyone who believes, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord and who is saved, his body was broken. That's, that's how you participate. That's how you, if you ask Jesus in your heart and you become a born again believer, then his body, was, it was already done no matter what. But you get to, you, 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 it will work for you because his body was broken out of love. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement needed for our peace was placed upon him. And by his stripes, you were healed. That's all you ever need as far as, is, is, I mean, you've got multiple other verses that say that, but just that one script, those scriptures right in there about walking in divine health, that's all you have to have is one verse, one scripture, but you're, you have a ton of them. But by his stripes, you were healed. You're not going to be healed. You're not, if I pray long and hard enough, I can maybe get healed if God's in a good mood. No, by his stripes, the word says his word is forever settled in heaven. So there's no chance of it. Well, I got a, a Bible that was written, my version says it was, it was printed in 1980. Well, it doesn't make any difference. There's no expiration date because this, by the stripes on Jesus' back, you were healed. And if you were healed, you are healed. And you grab a hold of this. And if you've been living, living with sickness and disease and infirmity and you've been tolerating it, Jesus says, don't do that anymore. Don't live b below your means, even in the, in the health realm, in the infirmity realm. Just go ahead and grab a hold of it and, and go for the word before you go for the medicine box, the medicine chest. Because this is a better way. Not evil or wrong to take medicine, but this is God's best. He gave us his best when it comes to our bodies and it comes to divine health. He's already given it to us. You don't have any price to pay for it because you couldn't pay for it if you wanted to. That's right. You receive it. Thank you. you know it's yours and you just let it do have its perfect way inside of you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the broken body of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that it was broken for us, mutilated, beaten, flogged, not only for our divine health, but for our peace. For our peace. Divine peace. Supernatural peace. Lord, we know, Father, we know that it was the ultimate sacrifice for you to sacrifice your only begotten son, Jesus, and that he would be so maligned that he was hardly recognizable as a man. That's he was right. beaten so much. But, but you knew that by the stripes on Jesus' back and because of his beating and vlogging and hardly being recognizable as a man, that that would give us not a shot at divine health, but give us, provide us divine health would be the, the rectification of any infirmity, any sickness, any disease, any pain that would try to attach itself to us. It is written, it is written that by his stripes we were healed 2,000 years ago. We have the same authority to use those words as Jesus did when he was being tempted by the devil. So we receive the broken body right now, the broken body of Jesus that was shed for us, that was accomplished for us, that was maligned for us, that was beaten for us, so that we can not only walk in healing, but walk in divine health. Let's go ahead and receive the broken body. Okay, verse 25 says, after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it 
in remembrance Amen. of me. Here we go again. In remembrance of me, both the broken body and the blood. Not remembrance of your sins or failings or shortcomings or what am I going to do about what? Nothing. Isn't that wonderful? Just discount all of that out of your mind, out of your heart. We're doing communion. I wish I'd have known this about 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything else because he's already paid for all this stuff and I'm doing this and only in remembrance of him. And when I rem remember him and think about Jesus, I go, ah, I'm in so much peace. I'm just in love with this Jesus. I'm, and he loves me. Amen. What a pleasurable thing to take communion then and not a religious thing and a, and a, and a time of being anxious no you to re receive his peace that you've already it's already been paid for and by the blood of Jesus it says for as often as you then drink this cup for as often as you do this means you do it whenever you want to do it as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you do show the Lord's death until he comes And you know that next verse says, Wherefore, whosoever, verse 27, shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Unworthily it means that, it's, that you're just taking it as grape juice or you're just taking it as, as, as a, a cracker. No. And just, just thinking, okay, and you start taking it back to the sin realm again, transgression realm again. That's doing it unworthily. You want to do it right, or you want to do it in, in accordance with the word. It's like, let peace just rule over you and know we are doing every bit of this 100% in remembrance of Jesus and how magnificent he is, his splendor, his glory, his beauty, and what he allowed to be done to himself out of love for you. For those that would be heirs of salvation, every one of us, every one of us, he's paid the price for everyone. Not everyone receives the free gift, but he's still done that. So take the blood in your hands and we're going to pray. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. We no longer have to think about the blood of bulls and goats, Lord. There had to be a continual sacrifice year after year. But when the blood of Jesus was shed for us, he did this thing one time forever for all. That we don't have to do it anymore. It's one time. It was shed one time for us. And in the blood of Jesus, there's salvation. There's deliverance. Thank you, Jesus. There's protection. Thank you, Jesus. There's provision. Everything Thank in the Jesus. blood of Jesus. One Thank drop would have been enough. That's right. But he gave us so much overkill, it's Thank not you, even Jesus. funny. Thank you, Jesus. With the shed blood. He gave it all up for us so that we might have life and life more abundantly. We thank you for the shed blood, Hallelujah. Father. We thank you for Jesus' shed blood. We receive it with joy and gladness right now. Right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living in you. Hallelujah. You know what? If y'all would stand to your feet. And I want to read this verse to you. And this is Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 14. Now, the New King James Version makes it a little bit different than the King James Version. So I'm going to tell you what the King James Version says. It says, for by one offering, they're talking about Jesus, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. And that's us. Yes. And then it goes on to say in uh, verse 16, this is the covenant he made a covenant with us. This yes. is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law into their hearts, his love, and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds there in verse 17, 
their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Yes. So if he doesn't remember me anymore, why are you going to? Why are you going to look in the past and say, I'm not good enough? Or today and say, I've messed up. I can't do this. I can't do this. But you know what? He said he has placed his, his love in your heart and your lawless deeds and your sins. He would remember no more. Is it because he forgot? No. He chose not to remember those things. That's right. That's right. So if you've had things that are not good in your heart, if there's anybody in this room that has not made Jesus their Lord and Savior, I want you to lift your hand right now. If there's anybody, you don't know if he is your Savior, then you lift your hand. If there's anybody that's online right now that's watching and you don't know if Jesus is your Lord, we're getting ready to say a prayer. And we want you to pray it with us. Because now, today is the day of salvation. Yes. And all things are back, passed away and behold, everything is new. No matter what happened before today, it doesn't matter. It's been washed in the blood of Jesus as though it never happened. And you don't need to condemn yourself. The Lord never condemns. Never. The Bible says there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. Don't do that self-condemnation. There are people that go and they get saved and they still don't know if they're saved, so they keep going back up to the altar every week or every month or whatever and try to get re-saved because they're not sure. I'm telling you, you can be assured yes. that if you believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus is Lord and you confess Him with your mouth, you are saved. Yeah. It is really that simple. Mm -hmm. Amen? And you so know what? Let's do this. I used to do that I, in the beginning oh, yeah. when I, I just was looking for a feeling and sometimes I felt like the feeling wasn't there so I'd go back and do it again and do it again and do it again. One day I finally said, you know what? This isn't worth it if I got to keep going back and doing this thing all over again. So, so I said, I'm just going to choose today. I'm, despite my feelings, and this is like, you know, 40 something years ago, despite my feelings, I'm just choose to believe Amen. that I am forgiven, I am saved, and, and, and never look back. And you know what? After that day, I never look back again. Because I refuse to be moved by feelings Hallelujah. or letting the enemy put thoughts in my mind. It, it's just a decision right. of the heart, Amen. a decision of the will, and it belongs to you. Amen. All right, let's do this. All right. If you're watching on live stream and want to, you want to receive Jesus as your or Lord and Savior, that or anybody that hadn't hand. raised their hand, but here we're going to do this prayer. And the word says you have to believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth mouth him and that he is your Lord and you will be saved so father in the name of Jesus father in the name of Jesus I believe in the Lord Jesus I Christ I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ I believe that he is the son of God I believe that he is the son of God I believe that he died for my sins I believe that he died for my sins and arose from the grave and rose from the grave and is seated at your right hand and is seated at your right hand forevermore forevermore I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. But I'm giving all that up. I'm exchanging the life of sin. I'm exchanging the life of sin. I'm giving it all up and yes. I'm exchanging the life of sin. This sin nature that I have, I want this your nature, nature of righteousness. This sin nature that I have, and I want your righteousness. Right now, in Jesus' name. Right now. I'm calling Jesus on the name, name of the Lord. I'm calling on the name of the Lord. Believing in my heart. Believing in my heart. And confessing with my mouth. And confessing with my mouth. That Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I know I am now saved. And I know I am now saved. Born Praise again. God, born again. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you're in this sanctuary or you're watching on live stream and you prayed that prayer with us, you are born again. You Amen. are. You have life forevermore. You're, you're going to be spending heaven with pleasures forevermore. And if you would give us a call at 404 697 5215 and tell us of your uh, born again experience Amen. we'd love to hear it and also we want to tell you about and tell you here in the sanctuary to make sure everybody knows about the baptism of the Holy Spirit which is a, another experience after uh, that you really everybody needs to have after they become born again and that is the 
receiving the power of God to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. If you have not received that, we got prayer ministers coming down here in just a minute here. They, in fact, come on down and they'll be glad to lead you in that prayer or any other prayer that you, anything of, of praying about uh, any other area of your life you want a prayer of agreement with. But watching online, call us 404-697-5215 and we will be great, glad to lead you tell you about first and then lead you in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That's where the power is and you want to operate in the power of God. All right, we're going to go. Is it time to say goodbye to the live stream? It is time to say goodbye. Thank oh, you. you. know what? Before we what? do, listen, let me say to everybody here and everybody on live stream, we have Love You this Saturday. Yes. So those of you who may not have already come to Love You and you want to come, it's not too late. It'll be easy to make up the first classes. There yeah. were only seven last month. It's free to you. The Lord told us freely we have received, so freely we give. This is discipleship. It will teach you how to walk in the balance of grace and faith and be more than conquerors. So we encourage you to come this Saturday at 845. Uh, be here at 845. This Saturday, bring your lunch with you. We eat together. There are seven courses, and we'll be through by 510. So please come join us. We would love to have you. I tell you what, you don't want to miss it. It is awesome. So. Come and be a part of Love You. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Good one. Goodbye, everyone watching on live stream. We thank you so much for having joined us today. We'll be back again next Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we invite you to, to uh, join us, and uh, we thank you so much. So.